do know from the research that uh, over 30% of athletes, um, you know, are having mental health problems and there's a high rate of suicide yeah. in, amongst ex-athletes. They're athletes, they move, they exercise, exercise is good for you. So why are they not feeling good? Hi everyone, welcome to another episode of Mental Wealth TV presented by WMHI, the Workplace Mental Health Institute. I'm Emmy, the Director of Psychology for the WMHI. I'm Peter Diaz, I'm the CEO for WMHI. And today we're talking about mental health and sports, athletes. So here we are in our gym, seemed appropriate. <laughs> um, but this isn't relevant just for athletes. This is you know, relevant for everyone. We're, we're going to talk about some of the recent news items that have come up, yeah. uh, which have really highlighted mental health amongst professional athletes. But even if you're not a big sporty person yourself, there's still some great lessons to learn sure. uh, as an individual and for workplaces as well, of course. Absolutely. We all know, we all know how important exercise is for your mental health and well-being. Um, but also for your physical health and well-being. Um, even if we try to avoid exercise as much as possible, we know that movement is good for mental health. We don't just know it intrinsically, like it's, we, we, there's a the part of us that knows that we should be moving more. But we also have the research to say that when people exercise, they feel physically better and they can think better and they can feel better. And psychologically, that is really good. But like you say, in the news lately, yeah. we have this seen... Is, this is the thing, we all know it's good for us and you know yeah. that we all should be probably moving a little more than we do. That's right. But I mean, I know for ourselves, we've been on a, a physical health journey and I think a lot of people have in the last 18 months decided that now's the time to focus on physical health. Um, but it takes a mental... Uh, resilience and mental stamina. I mean, every time you go to a workout, you want to push yourself a little bit. Yeah. And so I can only imagine for professional athletes how mentally strong they must be yeah. to get to that level of performance where they're you know, top of the world, yeah. uh, Olympians or, or number one in their sport. Um, that must be an incredible amount of resilience. So it's surprising then when we see items like uh, the recent one, you know, the, the, probably the most um, well-known one is Naomi Osaka, yeah. you know, who decided not to participate in media interviews and then ultimately to withdraw from the French Open yeah. because of mental health. So it's like... Absolutely. Uh, we, we wonder, how can this happen? Absolutely. Especially because you think, okay, so she is an athlete. Obviously, she's exercising. So if exercise is good for your mental health, how come she's depressed? How come she's finding it hard to function? I mean, we, we don't want to focus on Naomi because yeah. this is not a Naomi problem only. No. We do know from the research that uh, over 30% of athletes um, you know, are having mental health problems and there's a high rate of suicide yeah. in, amongst ex-athletes. Yeah. So this is a very interesting phenomenon because you, you would think they should feel good yeah. because they're athletes, they move, they exercise, exercise is good for you. So why are they not feeling good? Yeah. Um, but I mean, you, you raise another issue that's ex-athletes and I think there's probably different challenges at each stage of the journey. Mm -hmm. and, you know, perhaps when you're, you're building up your career, um, you know, there's a goal, there's something to aim for. Yeah. Then you get to the peak and that's when it should be amazing and you've achieved everything you want to achieve. It should be exciting. But and, and to come back to Naomi, apparently this kind of began for her after winning the 2018 US Open. Yeah. That game against uh, Serena Williams. Yeah. Um, she said it kind of started. It there. was a normal, it was not a normal journey for Naomi. Like she won. Yeah. But the way the media um, showed what happened, it's almost like she she, yeah. she didn't have that enjoyment of her win. It was yeah. everything about Serena Williams at the yeah. time. 
So, so was that an involvement? Could well, that now, have caused a problem? Not, not wanting to participate mm. in the media interviews, it sort of raises an interesting question for workplaces mm. because you know the officials said, well, this is part of your job, part of your commitment yeah. is to do this. So we will find you. Now, for her, $15,000, it's not much. She's the, the highest paid female athlete in the world. So, you know, you can kind of understand her saying, well, for my own self-care, yeah. I'll, I'll cop the fine and, and look after my well-being. Um, but then but is that good they enough? weren't satisfied that. That raises with the that. issue in so, workplaces. Is that good enough? Exactly. Yeah. The workplace kind of still wanted her to do that yeah. and said, you know, if you don't come, then you're going to be disqualified. Then threatened. That's right. You're so there's two aspects to that. One is uh, why is it that the mental health of people that are exercising in this case it's not perfect or really, really good because they are exercising a lot. I still feel and, the other, it and the other one is if if you do, because for athletes, that's their workplace. So, so what we have here, yeah. so we have taken care of ourselves for them, this is, would be their workplace. Absolutely. So in, in the workplace, if you have a mental health problem, how much adjustments can you have to your work if you have a, if you're depressed or you're, you're anxious, obviously there has to be some flexibility. But how far can a workplace go in that flexibility? It's a million dollar question. Yes. <laughs> so let's start with the first one. The first one is how come you can be doing exercise and not have perfect mental health when we know exercise is good for your mental health? Well, l let's examine that. So what do we know? Having having being serious about doing exercise for our well-being for the last two years, what do we know? Well, we do know that you need to be very disciplined, that um, exercise in the moment, it's painful. That's why most people avoid it. I mean, every time I go to do an exercise session, every single time feels like if I was starting the first day. Every single time. There has not been one single session where that has not been and the case. Every time I say, why am I doing this? <laughs> exactly. And why do I put myself through this? And you would think, you know, the body is now used to it. You would be okay. But it's not. It, it is a painful thing. So it's not surprising that most people, we, we tend to avoid it if we can. We, we take the lazy option. But we do know that when we do it, we do feel good. What is the difference between somebody exercising three times a week and an athlete that exercises five to seven mm. times a week, not just for an hour, but for three, four hours and they get up early and that becomes their life? Well, it's very different, isn't it? Mm. One, one is the pushing their body to the limit and beyond. Mm. Uh, I mean, athletes like us. Mm. Athletes, the, the body, their reaction, their way of thinking, it's completely different. And it's also to have a winning mindset. Yeah, which is a good thing. Yeah. I mean, if you're in, in any workplace, you want to be, you know, you want to have a team of high performers who yeah. are willing to to work hard, to, yeah, the more to people do a great the, job. That's, the more people with a winning yeah. mindset, you'd think better, yeah. you better. So one of the questions, and we've seen this come up in some of our training courses recently as well, is managers asking, well, how do I support those people to, perform really well at the highest level we can but at the same time I do care about mental health and well-being and I don't want to burn out this person I and especially in recent times you know people have been asked to do a lot and so how do we how do we keep up with just the sheer volume of work but and look after our teams at the same time yeah. how do I get that balance right what if I'm the cause of their mental ill health because I'm giving them all this work to do you know, and only a small amount yeah. of time to do it in. That's right. Yeah. So athletes, their status is when they win gold or silver mm -hmm. or bronze. Mm -hmm. But especially if they win gold, because gold, everybody remembers number one, but nobody remembers number two. So number one is what they go for. But how many number ones can you have? That's the problem. Yeah. <laughs> you have so many athletes trying to be number one, but only very few will become number yeah. one. And what happens if you do become number one and the limelight is taken away, like in yes. Naomi's case, the limelight was taken a little bit away or a lot um, from the occasion because of what happened. Yeah. So that, that's not how the psychology believes. you've also got to maintain that as well. 
the problem with that, you know, wanting the, we all love appreciation and we all love recognition and, you know, most people like others to, to acknowledge it. Some people don't want to be in the limelight and, and that's fine too. But the problem then is what happens when the feedback's not great. It's, I mean, it's very public. Isn't it? And that's, this is the thing with doing the media interviews, or, but also social media as well. I, mean, I, I don't know how many of us would cope so well if every day we were getting a whole bunch of people commenting on our work performance, yeah. you know, who, who aren't even in our workplace. Well, so imagine, like, imagine if you did what, your, your gym sessions with a camera following you around <laughs> and picking up everything that you do wrong and you do right. Yeah. And people making or, comments on that. every typo you make on an email or every, yeah. you know. So you want recognition yeah. and you want feedback. And I think that's an important thing yeah. in workplaces and for us, for our own mental health. Yeah. We want recognition. We want certain status, mm -hmm. but we also want uh, feedback. So uh, this is important. What we talk about we recognition, we don't talk about praise. Too, though. You have to be able to take that feedback too, yeah. you know, whichever way it comes. We can't just, as managers, tell everybody it's all wonderful all yeah. the time. We have to be real yeah. as well. So. But, but just like with exercise, yes, we, you do it for the benefit of, of, of the physicality of it, of the, of the psychology of it, but you know, as, as people, we want to know, uh, am I losing weight? That's a feedback mm, mechanism. Yeah. Or uh, am I get, putting muscle on? Am, am I looking a little am bit better? Stronger? Am I getting stronger? Am I getting, am I getting healthier? Do I have less colds? Do I have less, less, less physical issues? So that's kind of feedback. You also get the feedback from your trainer, uh, your form. Are you doing it right? Are you doing, what, what do you need to do? What are the sets? What's, what the repetition? So you're getting all that feedback, and in the workplace, we can learn very important lessons from that. So people need that recognition. They need a status, not necessarily recognition status. Do they feel important? Do they feel that their job is important? Is is that being done? And the other one is, do they do they get enough feedback to know to know that they're doing a good job? So when and this is the problem between school and universities and, and workplaces. You know, you go to school and university and you get feedback, you, you know, you, a lot. Get, you get a lot of feedback. You get told exactly how you're doing. Then you go into a workplace, you don't get There's no clear cut. Much. You don't get an A or a B or a C. Or you don't. <laughs> Sometimes you're flying solo, you don't know. Sometimes you know people are not happy with you, but you don't exactly know why they're not happy. Um, because people are afraid to tell you or we're politically correct or we don't, we don't like to hurt people's feelings. Mm. So, so that's a good thing for managers to, to think about and to remember. People need status, yeah. that they feel that, they, that it's important what they're doing, but they also need good re real feedback that is not sugar-coated, but presented in the right way. Yeah. And then if, if we have these elements, that's, that's not just the movement or the work that we're doing, but there's certain elements that need to be observed for good mental health to happen. Yeah. Let's okay. let's go back to the athletes because right. what <laughs> what is it? Are they getting enough status? And you I, would, I would think so. Yes. Yes, some of them do if they yeah. win gold. But what happens if they don't? When you, when you lose the game, or uh, or you yeah. come in second and nobody remembers your name. Yeah. So what's that impact? What what happens if you? train your body too hard and you burn yeah. your, your body because you can burn out physically and, and psychologically yeah, in sport. Course, yeah. So what happens if you do that? Yeah. So we know that a lot of kids that start, um, that are athletes that start playing rugby and, and they're taken on by the clubs, the majority of those never even make it to the yeah. field to play. Yeah. So what happens then? That's, that's not a very good situation to be in either. So being an athlete is no guarantee of good mental health. But it's a reality of life as well. I mean, we've spoken about this before, how artificial it is when everybody gets a participation award. Yeah. You know, the nature of competition is there's going to be a first to second. The nature of sport is there's going to be a team that wins and a team that loses the game. And that's yeah. how it is. And I, I so, probably wouldn't be fun for most people if it was there was no competition at all. Exactly. So we've Even got little a, kids want to know somebody has won. So, yeah. so but if we take it too far, exactly. then what do you do? 
I mean, we've got to, as individuals, be able to handle that when it's not a great result. Accept it when it is a great result and it's good feedback, but handle it when it's not. But is there, should there be more onus on the clubs or on this? Should they change the system to, to be more aware of mental health and well-being? No, that, and, that's, a good, you know, that's a good question. I mean, how much can you change the system? Because it, obviously it's working at, at a certain level. Yeah. I mean, would people actually want to attend uh, games where no one wins? I don't think they would. So there might be some non-negotiables. Yes. <laughs> so, so there's so much you can change. But what can people do, what can athletes do, and what can people do to support athletes and ex-athletes? That's the bigger question. I guess one of the questions is how, for example, with the media interviews, how crucial are they to the, again, to take it to a workplace setting, to the core requirements of the job? Yeah. These are the core requirement of the job. And so that's one of the things that at, in workplaces we need to work out when people are saying, I struggle with this part or that part, or can we can we amend this? Can we do flexible arrangements here or there? It's, is this a core requirement of the job? Yeah. Um, the easy example we often give is a firefighter, for example, needs to be able to climb a ladder. You know, yeah. that seems to be a core requirement. Whereas other things, you might have some flexibility. Some workplaces, you need to be at a certain place at a certain time, whereas others you can have flexible start and finish times and yeah. so on. Mm -hmm. so, so one of the things to remember here for anyone that is going, feeling that they're being burned out by the job, whether they're because it's a, they're an athlete or because they're in a job that they've been performing at a very high level for a long time and they're starting to feel burned out. The one thing that you must remember is this, you don't have to do that job. You don't have to do that job. You don't have to stay in that job. You don't have to be an athlete. You could just exercise three times a week and get a benefit of exercise. And if you enjoy that, that's probably better for your mental health than trying to push through. Now, that doesn't mean it's that you should run though, away. Because there was a time before you had this job. You, you haven't always had it. At yeah. some point, you went to an interview, you put in your application form, you answered the questions, you got the job and you were really excited that you got the job. And it happened. And, and it happened, but it was a choice. And so any choice you make, you can make a, you another can, one. You, you can, can change make it. it and you can change it and you can have another one. So that, that takes the pressure off. Yeah. That. Should you just drop the job because you're feeling stressed out? No. No. Because it could be a really good opportunity to learn some really good things about yourself, yeah. how you handle pressure, mm -hmm. how you handle stress, and how to become more resilient. Yeah. But you, you're not a saint, you're not a magical being, and sometimes the best thing to do is just to change jobs. Mm -hmm. But make sure that you get a mentor, a counselor, or somebody that, that you can talk to, to make sure that it is, that you've learned as much as you can from that situation about yourself and how you handle yourself there. Because it could be, you know, in my own life, looking back, sometimes I got stressed out about things that really didn't matter. Now that I yeah. look back, <laughs> it didn't really yeah. matter that much. You know, I mean, how important is it a person's opinion on social media whom I don't know, that could possibly be the village idiot somewhere. <laughs> but it, I don't know because it's on social media. How, how important is their opinion? But not, not a lot, no. is it? No. I mean, if, if, if my best friend says something about me, uh, knowing me well and, and loving me, that's important. Yeah. But somebody that I don't know, they can say whatever they want. And this is the thing, the more public you are, yeah. the more fans, but also the more enemies, the more criticism yeah, you get. Right. Both. So, yes, there's a lot we can do individually to, you know, strengthen our own resilience, yeah. to, to not take that stuff personally, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But, I mean, we talk about that mutual responsibility of, you know, it's both the individual and the, the organisation. They have a responsibility too. I mean, I, I do think... There are some cases where workplaces are simply asking for impossible oh, outcomes. Absolutely. And, and we have... If, if you previously <coughs> had three people doing this job and now you're asking one person to do it, mm -hmm. it may not be possible to get everything. Yeah. It just... 
and, and there we may have not seen be enough hours in a day, for example. In the last 10 years, we've seen that getting yeah. worse, um, getting people or firing someone or getting rid of a position, and now there's there's two positions being taken care of by one person, yeah. or even three positions being taken care of yeah. by one person. That is absolutely unfair. It is not just not right, but a person can only do so much. Yeah. And they could they could excel, you know, they could hmm. push it for a little while. Yeah. And I think, and, and you see, in where there's a good culture, you will see a team of people who are willing to say, all right, there's a particular demand right now, we'll step it up, we'll do the overtime. But you need to have the recovery time as well, the rest time. Again, just like with the, with the gym. You know? Yeah. A muscle needs to break and then have some recovery time to repair again. That's how it works. So. so as a workplace, I would be asking the question, okay, fine, I have one person doing three jobs now, but how, how much time and how much focus can they give properly to one thing? I mean, if you went to a specialist or to a, a surgeon um, for an operation and the surgeon had to do th the job of the surgeon, of the nurse and of the anesthetist all in one, how safe would you feel? That they how, how, how certain would you feel <laughs> that they're going to, they're going to do a good job, that they can actually focus on what they're doing? Probably not, not very yeah. much. So that's why you don't have the surgeon doing three jobs. Yeah. You have the surgeon doing one job and then they have a support team. So that's something to think about in workplaces. You know, do we want a good job done here? Yeah. And then how much, how much are we supporting this person yeah. to do a good job? And that also raises this idea of team as well. So uh, looking at the well-being for people who work within teams versus well-being of people who work individually mm. and again there's individual sports and team yeah. sports and we have that sense that when you're on your own there, there's a lot more isolation you know if the whole team loses the game or the whole team fails at least we can all commiserate together yeah. and, and you know support each other through that but as an individual you're very alone so there's a lot of people working alone now working from home isolated geographically yeah. etc so we need to make Keep sure. Keep that in mind. They call it the hybrid workforce. Don't they? Yeah. Where, um, well, yeah, some people are doing a hybrid work yeah. and home, and some home. are purely home, and everyone's in a very, very different situation now. Mm. So, some changes can be done at the workplace level, mm -hmm. but some changes are individual. We're all at different places in our maturing, in our growth, yeah. both psychologically and physically. Mm -hmm. And it's good that we look to ourselves and say, okay, what do I need to take responsibility with? And also not expect that the workplace will do everything to keep us. I've seen sometimes workplaces doing everything possible to keep the job for a person when the best thing they could have done yeah. for that person would have to help them out of the work. Yeah. So and don't fire them, yeah. don't fire them and just forget about them. But you know, what? why not put together a plan in which we help that person look for another job? And this kind of relates also to what you were saying earlier about ex-athletes and the challenge they have going from one job to having to find something new. And I think, I think for a lot of people there at that point now, you know, reassessing what's important to me, what do I want, um, you know, what works for my whole of life, not not just for for generating an income. And and a lot of people are going through that sort of transition, which is a shift in identity, yeah. isn't it? It's a because work is so much a part of who we are, but to say, well, now I'm going to do it uh, many times radically differently. I, I think that identity shift is interesting. I think that's what people struggle with in yeah. making a transition from one. But yes, it's been said, you know, there's a, a whole school of, of psychology that says that it is people's identity uh, movement that causes psychological problems. Mm. So. Um, um, well, not an existential a, approach. Yes, it's, it's a bit of an existential identity focus approach in which says through life we keep changing identity. So at one point I was a two year old and now I'm not. How do I deal with that? Yeah, and, and we see that sometimes people have got a lot of problem when they turn 30, <laughs> that magic number 30. And, and they have a hard time dealing with being 30. Other people have got a hard time, even though they're very happy when they get married, but after they marry, they go, oh, 
who am I in this relationship? I was single, now I'm married. How do I fit into this? I, I, I was mm. free and now I'm a yeah, parent. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Parenthood. Yeah. And um, it's very big, not just for mothers, but also for fathers. Yeah. How do I fit into this? How do I, into this little nucleus family now that we used to be two? I used to get all the attention and now I don't. There's another little third person that gets most of the attention. So it's, and it's not being spoiled. See, a lot of people immediately go and accuse people. Oh, they're being spoiled. Oh, Naomi has had it too good. Or No, it's not true. It, it has nothing to do with that. It's just identity changes can be very hard for people. And while they're finding out and they're trying on their new identity, there's a lot of learning that happens. There's a lot of challenges, psychological challenges that come to the, to the person. Same thing as when people get a job. They were not a rehab counselor before. Now they're a rehab counselor. And they're happy about it for two weeks, but then it starts hitting them. Ooh, have you heard of the imposter syndrome? Yes. But that's what we're talking about. A new job, yeah. but also a promotion. A, when you've been uh, in one promotion. workplace and then now yeah. you're the team leader and you used to be part of the team and now exactly. you're the team leader and, and so on. It goes through. Yeah, that's right. So now this, on the executive board. And, uh, so I think sometimes we forget that at the sea, very senior level, the execs, they're still human oh, yeah. too. And they're yes. people too and have human mm. struggles as well. So. Exactly. Leaders are people too. And they're not necessarily all-knowing they don't have all the right answers and they're learning with us yeah. so we gotta cut them some slack too and same thing like that's what we learn from athletes pick athletes that's a normal natural human process they are working at, at the edge of human performance so that's why they're a very interesting study um, I think this, this relates to the hero's journey as well, which mm. I mean, we won't go through right no. now, but it's that's a really, I think, useful kind of um, understanding to have of that, that transition process and yeah. how we can make that easier for ourselves and for others as well. Yeah. Overall, I'm not, um, I'm not saying people shouldn't aim for high performance. I think there's one of the beautiful things about being a human being is our capacity to shine yeah. at the right moment and in the right circumstances. And, and I call that high performance. And that's beautiful. You want a team of high performance, but you need to understand that we are biological beings and psychological beings. We can't be high performance 24 hours a day. At some point we need a rest, at some point we need a timeout and we need to get our breath. This is and this is the important lesson, you know, is it time to, to me, have a little break? The psychological model that sort of demonstrates that so nicely is that support challenge. You know, we talk about this in, when we're talking about resilience, that you want to challenge yourself, but yeah. you also need to do the self-care support. There's that balance of push and grit and stamina and hard work and perseverance alongside self-care and nurturing and being kind to yourself and, and you, you've got to get that balance right and it's very individual and yeah. some people may err more towards the push 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 I mean I see a lot of people that I work with the, um, the high performers of perfectionism and, and the non-stop and that doesn't work for a long period it works to a point but not mm. over time and then you've got other people that are too perhaps too much on the we'll take it easy i'll take a day off here yeah. and there and it, it becomes more and more and more until they're not able to achieve the things yeah. that they want either so and either extreme get the balance. and either extreme is not good for your mental health yeah like i see it too often oh you can't be a high performer because that's not good for your mental health that's not true most high performers have have, have got yeah. are really mentally healthy yeah. nothing wrong with them now there are cases where some high performance should have had a break they should have stopped and smelled the roses a little bit but they it's up to them that's their decision yes. we, we can't be the judge of yeah. that now I also see a lot of problem with people being very soft soft and too soft and we should not have any requirements from us ever in our lives nothing should be hard i shouldn't experience a negative feeling well, that's hogwash. Yeah. That's bad mental health. Well, it's a, really a non-functioning human being, it's not a normal thing. Yeah. 
we, we need to help people to be functioning because it's good for them, it's good for us, it's good to be part of a society, it's good to be part of a community, of a tribe, and be productive in it. Yeah. And it's not about making money, it's about we feel good when we give to others. Yeah. And that's good for everybody. So let's okay. remember that, let's keep yeah. it in that. We don't want to be at that extreme, mm -hmm. this extreme, we want to be a nice, comfortable middle and uh, allow ourselves to grow. Cool. Yeah. But look, I would be very interested in, in knowing if people have questions, they can just yeah. send us questions yeah. uh, in the comments and uh, looking forward to that. This. What is your experiences around this? Have you been high performers and you burnt out? Or are you high performance and you're still high performance and non-high performance people annoy you, frustrate you? That's also a problematic. What is it that... Or if you've made that transition and then, you yeah. know, sea change, green change, career change. You know, yeah. What, yeah, that would be an interesting one as well. Yeah. And in, in, in the area of workplace adjustment, have you had a person that was really difficult don't give names, of course. <laughs> uh, have you had a person that was really difficult to make adjustments for? Um, did you solve the problem? Yeah. How did you solve the problem? I know a lot of managers are always mm. interested to hear what other people have done. Yeah, because it's, it's a tough one. For managers, yeah. it's, it's a very tough yeah. one. Because uh, most of the managers I've met, I know that's not very popular to say so, but most of the managers I've met are very nice people. Yeah. And they're going through the journey with us. Yeah. So they, they really try to help. Yeah. Um, so it would be very interesting to see what people's experiences around that is. But thanks very much for watching. And yes, thank you. We'll see you next time. And see you next time. Hi, I'm Emmy Golding, Director of Psychology for the Workplace Mental Health Institute. We hope you liked the video. If you did, make sure to give it a thumbs up. We have more and more videos being released each week. So when you subscribe, you'll get a notification letting you know when a new one's just been published. So make sure to hit that subscribe button and don't miss out on this vital information for yourself, your colleagues and your loved ones.